welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, my cat's begging for attention. Um, <laughs> so we will be talking about HP. Wow, my book is just like not wanting to be on camera. There we go. HP Lovecraft. Um, Call of Cthulhu is an interesting game. Yeah. You want to grab that one? So that so we've got the uh that what Marchosius is holding up is the um D20 conversion book. So you can run Call of Cthulhu as a D20 game. And what Def Malkavian is holding up is the seventh edition Keeper's Rule book, which Oh look, I also have. Ooh. But mine has a bunch of bookmarks in it right now because I've been reading it today. Um I actually want to open this by reading an excerpt from one of my favorite uh it's actually a poem by hp lovecraft it'll set the tone um and and the the kind of the uh give you that that real that vibe that i really want to capture here with what we're talking about tonight so uh okay. let me put on my narrator voice but before you do that we have to play some smooth jazz in the background so <laughs> Uh, What's the wait. name of the poem? Uh, the po it's Nyarlathotep. Ah, uh, um, who's made a uh, appearance in Providence? <laughs> Not yet. Um, my cat's also going to rub his face on the book if I let him. I'm going to actually read the end of the prose poem. So if if you don't want spoilers, I guess mute me for a minute. But narrator voice. Ooh. Screaming sentient, dumbly delirious, only the gods that were, were can tell. A sickened, sensitive shadow, writhing in hands that are not hands, and whirled blindly past ghastly midnights of rotting creation, corpses of dead worlds with sores that were cities, charnel wind that brush the pallid stars and make them flicker low. Beyond the world's vague ghosts of monstrous things, half-seen columns of unsanctified temples that rest on nameless rocks beneath space and reach up to busy vacua above the spheres of light and darkness. And through this revolting graveyard of the universe, the muffled, maddening beating of drums and thin, monotonous whine of blasphemous flutes from inconceivable, unlighted chambers beyond time, the detestable pounding and piping whereunto dance slowly, awkwardly, and absurdly the gigantic, ten tenebrous, ultimate gods, the blind, voiceless, mindless gargoyle, soul, Yarla Totem. I really hope me snapping that book closed caught on my mic. Uh, <laughs> so I, I've never heard that one before. Oh yeah, that's that's uh, one a of my good favorites. one. That's one you of know, my favorites. I just, I just started reading his actual works, but uh, you know, much like the other episode where we read the beginning of Cult, it uh, it brings you somewhere awesome. That's that's why I wanted to read it. Um, yeah, it really brings to mind what. I personally like to capture in Call of Cthulhu. There's an other, other worldliness to it. There's an otherness to it. And uh, and if anyone's really paying attention to Twitch chat, obviously we were talking about H.P. Lovecraft was a very problematic writer. Um, he's a there's a phrase the problematic favorite, um, and he's definitely my problematic favorite author in that he was incredibly racist. He was a writing in the the 20s, 30s, and 20s and 30s. Um, and you could say he's a product of his times, but it's still unacceptable, in my opinion. I mean, there's just. He... I need to. I, I need to put a. I need to put a caveat onto that because I think it. it's. It, I think it's important to understand that around around that time was very very problematic. But m more importantly, he touches on a few things that probably shouldn't resonate now, but did at the time. Um, yes. Things like 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 extreme xenophobia. There was around the time that the uh, King Tut's tomb was being cracked open, yep. so there was a lot of fear of other cultures, and yep. it was a lot more of a, especially in New England, um, it was a lot more of a, a hyper religious, um, hyper Christian um, kind of feeling that that anything that wasn't of um, the, the a particular the, worldview, 
Yep. Right. It, it was very different and bad. Um, yep. I think it, that now there, there needs to be a little bit of cultural relativism um, and an understanding that he, if he was writing the same stuff today, it would be extremely offensive and and it would not resonate with us. Right. But he's so ingrained into our culture um, with with Cthulhu. I mean, there's Cthulhu plushes and everything else right. um, that I, I think that it's important to to just take a second and appreciate that. Though there are prob- problematic aspects of Lovecraft, um, that doesn't mean that you need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Exactly. Um, to that point, he may have had problematic viewpoints that I certainly do not agree with in any way, shape, or form. Anyone who knows me can elaborate on that. I'm not going to right now. Yeah. Um, without being the way he was, we wouldn't have gotten the type of horror that we got. He invented an entire genre of horror. Cosmic horror wouldn't exist without Lovecraft. It just wouldn't. No one else wrote in that way before him. And he inspired generations of writers, many of whom have become more uh, popular than he was. Yeah. And it's that Neil Gaiman, Stephen King, Clive Barker, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. He, his fear, his xenophobia is what inspired those stories. So while I don't, I don't, you know, it's not a good thing. It inspired something that we can learn from. And, um, you know, not being super familiar or uh, having read more than a couple of his short stories, although I endeavor to read them all, I so far have not seen any of his political or um more problematic views it doesn't cross over into his work range the, uh the only one it comes out very clearly in is horror of red hook okay um that's the only one that it really comes out in the in's mouth in's mouth too uh horror uh, the, was it the um yes. in's, it, it does come out in um shadow over in's mouth. thank you shadow over in's mouth yeah it's it's particularly the way that he has certain descriptions is it, I think there's a couple of terms that are pretty offensive that he utilizes that weren't offensive at the time. Um, yeah. yeah. Especially with the descriptions of that Innsmouth look that yep. I think he says over and over again. Yeah. Um, but it, it's the you utilizing the analog of, you know, otherworldly, you know, gods that have come here long ago to, you know, enslave the earth or destroy the earth. And there are groups of people that are, coming together under cloak and dagger to worship these things and, and yeah. you know welcome in the apocalypse like those are all analogs to you know fear of other cultures and and fear of people that are different from you um and where the inspiration comes from is not a good place um but the result is is interesting oh, yeah. and i think when you take it quite literally especially with call of cthulhu of actual alien creatures that are taking over it's pretty it's pretty interesting oh yeah Um, yeah it's definitely it's it has an interesting flavor to it i think that it's hard for me to put this into words that i want to say well i feel like you guys um are obviously extremely knowledgeable about the man and the passion of his uh, writing and aware and knowledgeable that he was a flawed person um i think the point's really been made (laughs) Steph Valkavia is saying, "Let's move on. Let's, let's move on. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, and no, because we could have an entire podcast about oh, Lovecraft yeah. as a person, um, and it would be valid because he is an interesting yet controversial, yes. uh, brilliant, flawed human being. Yes. Um, and you know, we can talk about this as long as you want. I don't mind, but uh, we but do is... have a role playing game to look into. I'm we sorry." Do. Uh, no, yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, <laughs> we we will actually have that podcast at some point. I would like to expound on some of the things that. Yeah, and I think up. you guys made some fantastic points about uh, <laughs> the throwing the taking the baby, not throwing up. Uh, yeah, yeah it, the bath water with any uh, and with you the could, banana. <laughs> I watched that, so I'm just gonna say silly things. Too. Don't th- don't throw the baby out with pineapple. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, Call of Cthulhu. Call of Cthulhu is a tabletop role playing game uh, invented in. 1981 by Sandy Peterson, published by Chaosium. Um, it was 
created originally as a supplement to Chaosium's basic role-playing system, so BRP, which it still uses today. And um, it's really influenced a really wide variety of games since then. So it's been around since 1981. It's older than me. <laughs> um, and me. And the, since then, it has a lot of offshoots. So you have the original Call of Cthulhu, which recent, uh, about two years ago entered its seventh edition. Um, and since then, it's inspired uh, a bunch of settings and additional rule sets like Delta Green, Cthulhu Now, uh, Cthulhu by Gaslight, the D20 conversion that Marchosius has behind him, um, uh, Pulp Cthulhu. Uh, there's a lot of them. Um, it's also been adapted into a bunch of uh, other mediums, like video games. Uh, the more most recently, we had the Call of Cthulhu game by Cyanide, as well as Sinking City. Um, there was a Cthulhu Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth game, which is based on Shadow Over Innsmouth, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, that mm -hmm. came out in the late '90s, early two, early 2000s, and it's very buggy, but it's a fun game. I might play it on stream sometime. I can get it to actually work. <laughs> um, <laughs> then then there's the also yes, Mo Modifius's game. Oh no, we lost. Oh, I hit the wrong button. I'll be right back. <laughs> well, our cameras are a little screwed up for a minute. Sorry about that, folks. But uh, yeah, um, the Mod oh yeah 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 that's um, uh, uh, Cthulhu Octon. Cthulhu Octon as well. Um, and then, of course, there's a bunch of board games and card games that have come out. There's a Call of Cthulhu card game. There's the ever-popular Arkham Horror board game that people have seen. Um, and then, of course, Sandy Peterson has his own game that he's published, uh, Cthulhu Wars, which is an incredibly expensive game if you haven't seen it, but it's a good one. Um, I've heard of it. Welcome back, Death, Death Malkavian. You Thankfully, know, you talked about some Eldritch Horror stuff, and I just went mad for a minute. <laughs> Thankfully, you popped back up in the proper position for our camera placement. Um, so yeah, uh, Call of Cthulhu utilizes the basic role-playing system, which, with the addition of a sanity system, and with 7th edition, the addition of a luck system. And then, it, so the basic, I'll go briefly on this, because I could dive into BRP a lot, because it, I actually, it's my favorite dice mechanics. But um it uses a percentile, so a D100 system. You roll two D10s, um, and you basically use that for all of your rolls except for damage rolls on attacks. Um, your results can range from 1 to 100, and this, it, which determines your success or failure. And your st stats are um, on a scale of 1 to 100, typically. And you want to roll lower than your stats so if you and your stat your so your stats and your skills are a percentage um so if you have a art stat um and you have 75 in it you have a 75 percent chance of succeeding so if you roll your dice and it's under 75 you succeed so uh, you want low is good which is the reverse of a lot of other systems except for when you're rolling right. damage and then high is good which is a little confusing later um that's another stream um, and then there's there's uh, critical success and critical failure. So if you roll like a one to something, it's a critical success. And if you roll 96 to 100, it's a critical failure. And then there's bad effects and good effects that happen based on that. Um, it's like one to f one to 15. Sorry, one to 15 is a critical. So most of your stats, you have a baseline of 15. Um, so that's 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 pretty much the the basis. Um, the only skills that I would touch on beyond that is you have a uh, skill called Ethos rating, mm -hmm. um, which is how much you know about the mythos, and that inversely affects your sanity. So every time you put a dot into your mythos skill, you lose a permanent sanity that you can never regain. Uh, and then sanity is rolled the same way. So you start off with a, a 99 sanity. And then as you get points in Mythos, that goes down. Um, you can also lose sanity from witnessing different horrific things. You could start with a slightly lower sanity for certain benefits. And then 7th edition added a luck system, which works. It's interesting. Um, I would, I, I L -U -L -U -X would be... L-U-X or L-U-C-K, like luck? L-U-C-K. Yeah. Uh, 
I would honestly need almost an entire half of the stream to dive into the luck system because it's new and it does interesting things. So I'm just going to say it adds a cool new mechanic to the game. Um, can we can we touch on? I, I want to go back to the the sanity, the sanity system, system for a second. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna yeah. actually break out my book for that because I have that system marked for to discuss. Go for it. Did, do, how does that impact um, your kind of like gameplay? The sanity system, not just like knowledgeable. Yeah. I get the idea that it, it the more knowledgeable you are about the mythos, um, the more insane you are the less score you have you go from probably a 99 to a 90 and so on and so forth yep so the more you know about the mythos the crazy you are but how does that impact gameplay so in gen so in general it doesn't like you don't you don't you you should i would ideally role play your characters slowly losing their grip on reality as their sanity goes down but it's more specific circumstances so when yep. you have to when you have a sanity loss which is so kind um, of like triggers Yes. Um, so you would have a sanity. So I would say roll your sanity. And if you fail that roll, you have a sanity loss. Sometimes, regardless of whether you pass or fail, you also have a sanity loss. But that that's, that's very situational. Mm -hmm. um, so what would happen is when you lose sanity, uh, depending on how much sanity you lose, I would tell you to have a reaction of some form you could simply you could literally just jump back in fright cry out in terror um you could have an involuntary reaction um you could attack or you could freeze in panic um and that can drastically affect the situation especially if you're in combat um or hiding trying, or trying to be sneaky and you cry out in terror um so there's an automatic involuntary visceral reaction when you lose sanity which is one key piece to it. Um, but then if you lose five or more sanity from a single roll, there's actually a much larger effect. So this is called temporary insanity. And what happens with temporary insanity, and there's a whole um, table for it, but like you can actually have uh, bouts of amnesia, um, violence, paranoia. You could faint. Um, you could flee in panic. Um, you could develop a phobia temporarily. And some of these can be long-term, too. Um, as you lose more sanity, there's an entire system for taking on uh, bouts of madness. And it's randomized. And derangements, right. Yep. And it's randomized. You, ro you, roll a, you roll a D10, and there's a table, and you can kind of base it off that. And the, the book gives you... There's a... How many pages? I, there's... I felt like there was like 100 different derangements in there. At one oh, point. yeah. I mean, there's a good... 15 pages just diving yeah. into the sanity system and how it, how to effectively use it in your game to shape how the investigators are interacting with the world. Can't I can't help but to think about um the Malkavian. I was going to say I, um even writing a character from a Malkavian uh, I'll be playing in a future game. This was a gold mine. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, particularly in V5, where they didn't dive deeply into the yes. derangement system, All Cthulhu 7th Edition can give you a lot of uh, flavor for how to uh, portray that in a tasteful way. Um, Evelyan, uh, disappointed that the sanity system doesn't affect the game in a mechanical way. Um, mm. I agree, but I, I appreciate that it's more of a situational effect. Um, I ran you randomize it and it's like well you freeze in terror oh. or you can base it on how your character's personality works and it's like well you you just blindly attack and that yeah. that in itself is a very mechanical effect on the game because it's going to completely change the scope of the scenario that you're in at the time. Yeah, sure like you're you're with your you're with a group that's investigating you know something that's going on I don't know let's just say you go to the docks let's be cliche about it. You, you go to the docks and you're investigating, you know, some kind of stone or, or trying to get to yep. uh, the guy that lives in the, the boathouse or what have you. Um, and there is some kind of strange creature that's that's inside of the boat. And instead of running, you go to attack it when you essentially didn't want to. And it, this yep. thing could overpower you. I mean, like that, those types of things can probably happen with this. Exactly. Yeah. And, y you know, in the experience I've had with the translation that, they adapted into 
a uh, video game, which is on Switch, uh, PS4, probably Xbox and PC. Um, you can, I can see this being a thing that happens on tabletop where you have a moment of lapsed sanity, and it's not necessarily what your character does in the scene that will affect the scene. Sometimes that character can all of a sudden live um, a moment in time in their head that seems to span a very long time, which you've seen in um, at least some of the Lovecraftian writings I've read, like um, Dagon, where yeah. he's in a bad situation. Suddenly he's in a fantasy world in a landscape that's completely alien with structures that were made um, carved into mountains dedicated oh, yeah. to old gods and things, you know. And uh, next thing you know, you wake up and you're in a taxi. You have no idea how you've gotten it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and um, the person who's driving it has, like, one eye, and he's staring at you the entire time he's driving, but he's not hitting anything. And it's those are the kind of things where you are having an issue with your sanity in the way that you no longer perceive reality in the way everyone else does. Yep. The storyteller is now taking you on a bizarre, wild ride that your player character's mind is generating, or perhaps something from beyond your mind is generating to either inspire you into more madness, or who knows? Uh, you can have as much fun with that as you want. Um, you could be in a grocery store as a character, have a moment of sanity where you just fail on a simple check. You're doing an investigating. You're trying to pick the best brand of tuna fish. You yep. pick up a packet. It's got Charlie the tuna on it. Next thing you know, it reminds you of one of these fish guys that you <laughs> punched in the face at the docks when you were trying to find Billy Sue, the little girl who went missing, your private eye. That Charlie the tuna looks like one of those fish men. And next thing you know, you're having a full on freak out panic attack in aisle two. And uh, oh boy, there come the feds. Yep. Exactly. That's really, it, it really kind of plays PTSD a little bit. Which is really, I think it's really interesting. I mean, that's one of the big things is that, you know, that fear of slowly losing your mind, um, but also putting you in putting you in this kind of uh, a system of fear. Uh, it, it's very it's cool. Great. No, it's fantastic. <laughs> it's a really good system, um, and it's it's inspired a lot of additional supplements. I mean, uh, Call of Cthulhu has been around for a really long time, um, and there's some really famous supplements and scenarios developed for it like uh, uh dreamlands or on Green. the orient express well that's Del delta green's an entirely separate game almost um it's yeah. more like a military a government experience experiment it's like a game. vietnam war thing right um or... it could be vietnam you could make it more of like a um modern yeah, what's the what were the government experiment experiments? MK Ultra. MK, you can make it more of like an MK Ultra style game. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm thinking more like the uh, the scenarios that have been drafted for it. Like the there's game you can some of these scenarios take months to play, if not years. Um, Horror on the Ori Orient Express, Mass of Nyarlathotep, which is my personal favorite. Beyond the Mountains of Madness, which plays on the the Lovecraft story. Um, the mountains at, of madness. at the mountains of madness which is my personal favorite short story by him um so there's really good material out there um but before we really dive into the lore uh the the dice system itself like like there's a, definitely ways to leverage the effects of sanity in the game um i did want to go give a brief overview of the stats and the skills, like the, how the game is set up, like how you would build a character as well, because that that actually plays into how sanity works in the game. Um, anyone who's played any of the Call of Cthulhu board games or card games knows that like the character, the investigator you play and the, 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 your job or your uh, career path kind of affects how, what, how your sanity balances. So Call of Cthulhu is kind of based on um, different. It's a very different from Dungeons and Dragons or Vampire. So you you have stats kind of like you do in Dungeons and Dragons: strength, constitution, size, dexterity, appearance, intelligence, power, and education. Power being kind of like willpower. Um, and all of those are based on a um, one to a hundred scale for the players. And you. 
kind of you 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 roll them, but they they're not as important as the skills. I'm not going to list all of the skills, obviously. Um, and then so you also have an occupation. So occupation is kind of like class. Um, it's also like the archetype archetype in cult. So you would pick your um, you could be an antiquarian, you could be an athlete, you could be an entertainer. A journalist, journalist, yep. A, uh, a librarian, a, a police detective, a uh, private you investigator. Can be, you can even be a cultist, if I recall. You can be. You could be a. You could be a zealot. Uh, that's one of the listed yes. ones. So you could be a religious zealot. You can be a cultist, but that gets a little weird. Um, the one cultists thing I, in this in this game are kind of adversaries, right? Yeah, usually they're usually considered to be bad guys. Yeah. Um, and for modern games, you could be a hacker, or the, so they have rules for both like the 1920s setting and the modern setting. Um, but your yeah. occupation affects how much money you start with, and it also gives you a certain number of skill points to start with. Best. Um, and then it, there's general like character creation assistance that they give you and equipment and things like that. But then it really just dies into assigning. So the character sheet is. Uh, oh. Uh, sorry, one more thing I want to say is that uh, you select an age, and your age range actually affects your abilities. So it'll affect your stats and your skills, which is interesting. It's just the only system I've seen that really uses age as a meaningful um, stat. Yes. But the character sheet gives you your stats. Um, you have a move rating. Uh, this is a game that definitely benefits from having miniatures and a map sometimes, because there's a lot of moving around in when you when. Call of Cthulhu is a game that you typically don't want to get into combat because you're probably going to die. But if you do, having miniatures and a map and a layout is incredibly helpful because then you can avoid dying for as long as possible. As as far as I understand, <clears throat> and I've only I've only played you know admittedly one Call of Cthulhu game, um, but as far as I understand, there's a lot of tangibles that are involved in this game that are different than other games. Um, Oh, a yeah. lot of people incorporate like printouts and yep. letters and that kind of yep. stuff. It's one of the it's one of the tabletop games that uses um, props more heavily than any other game. Um, for me, uh, at planning a Call of Cthulhu streamed game, that's actually been an interesting thing I'm trying to deal with because typically I would use props for Call of Cthulhu. I would use you know when you find a letter from a, a cultist wrote to another, I would give you the letter, um, or maybe you find like a ceremonial item. So trying to figure out how to translate that onto stream is interesting because I don't want to just like hold it up and show it. That's weird. Um, but like then like how do do I use roll twenty or do I use another system? So, you know, screen I, screen share of graphics or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could put a link to a uh, Dropbox that's just for the show for people to download the PDF that was handed out and they could see it for themselves. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah. So that th that is an interesting factor of the game because I love uh, you know. Um, Vampire, to me, is very much theater of the mind. Call of Cthulhu is very much a dinner theater. Um, I like to hand things out. I like to pass them around and show you the props and the letters that were handed out. And I use all those physical things. So, I believe it was... Um, uh, who was it from Jackalope that, that put together this, this really impressive... Matthew Webb? Matt Webb. Web. They put together this really impressive, um, like Call of Cthulhu um, Necronomicon. That was Matt essentially. Webb. Essentially, <laughs> yeah, that yeah, was yeah. Awesome. yeah. Anything leatherworking is probably Matt Webb. Yeah, <laughs> it was amazing. It was, it was beautiful. Um, so, so yeah, there's a lot of tangibles in Call of Cthulhu, um, but there's also. I, go ahead. I was gonna say I love. Um, you know, it's easy to get off the track of. Uh, you know, people who are not as familiar with Lovecraft or yep. tabletop role-playing games, the draw for this game, if you've never been introduced to it, you're not familiar with any of these concepts, is that the style and feel of the game is that you are a kind of like an explorer. No matter what archetype you are, yep. it is a noir detective style uh, game. Yep. Um, and it's a it's typically always a mystery that you're trying to solve. And so, yeah, th I think that whole vibe and feel is something you don't get in a, really any of the other tabletop role-playing games, which makes it unique. 
Now, the fact that you have all these interesting cultists and this lore that you could just fall into, uh, you know, to take a deep dive with, it, uh, it's got so much to offer. That was the thing I was going to touch on, is that um, the way I approach the game, uh, you create your character and you have uh, your occupation, and then uh, I go through with each player and I say, so what, what is the what reason your character cares about these yes. other, this, uh, this mystery? Um, what experience have they had in the past that drove them to become fascinated with the occult or um, these monsters or the, or the strange conspiracy theories that are happening in their hometown or the cult or, you know, researching cultist activity. What, give yeah. me that one hook. And it could just be that there is a crime solved and they get in over their head. They might have, yep. have any idea that any of this is actually happening. And suddenly they're in a world of trouble. Exactly. Uh, or, you know, uh, I had one player once who's just said, he's not, but um, his sister is missing. She disappeared yeah. randomly. And he's looking into her disappearance and he's following every lead. And I was like, okay, fantastic. That's, that is what I need. What would be for, for the people that are watching that may not be familiar with what a, a Call of Cthulhu game essentially would be? Like, what's in a nutshell, you know, what's a, a Call of Cthulhu um, campaign? What is it? What essentially is it? So, an overview, you know, beginning, middle, and, and end. What, what, yeah. what are we looking at here? So, like an in, example. In Call of Cthulhu, you play, you, you, your character is called an investigator, and that it is a, an investigative game. You are investigating a mystery. Uh, the mystery is typically something involving the Cthulhu mythos. So um, if I was going to run a one-shot specifically, so something that has that clear-cut beginning, middle, end, um, typically it would start off with a hook, and the players and the investigators would be invited to a place or asked to look into a specific occurrence. So maybe it's a haunting, maybe it's a... Um, a missing person, or maybe it's um, trying to retrieve a lost item. And then, so then the investigators come together and they embark on this mission and they start looking into whatever the case is and investigating it. Um, and then typically things will go sideways at some point in that. So tip, uh, either they will discover the mystery and have be in way over their head and all of a sudden because it's an actual cult or there's an elder god involved or star spawn or night gaunts um and then it and then the end is usually them either trying to extract themselves from this nightmare situation they got themselves into or it's them trying to still resolve the investigation despite it um and come out of it alive. So there's a lot of my favorite. There's a very, very, very famous uh, Call of Cthulhu scenario, which is about a haunted house. And the investigators are called in and they go into the house and they're looking into things and um, everything seems to be fine and normal. And then as they and then as they're investigating the house and as the night goes on, things start to go get a little weird. And. Uh, you know, objects start to move, and then there's a really famous scene where they'll they'll go into the bedroom of the house, and after the after people are in the bedroom, suddenly the door slams shut and the bed starts to move, and the bed flies across the room, and if they don't pass their dodge rolls or whatever, the bed hits them and sends them flying out the window and kills them. Like it specifically says, like <laughs> do enough damage to kill that person. <laughs> it's like okay, <laughs> like. That's what happens. So what? 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 So what happens? So if if there's let's just say you're midway in a game, second session, you killed your character. Um, what do you do? So my recommendation to anyone who plays Call of Cthulhu is typically create two characters. Back up. Yeah. <laughs> create two characters. Have the second one waiting. You you might need it session one. You might need it session thirty. But was you're beer, gonna was need it that beer character. Fest when the when the twin comes in, like, hey, it's the same person. Only yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I've literally had that situation happen. Someone turned around, changed, like, 
changed a couple stats on their character sheet and handed it back to me and they're like it's his twin brother and i was like you know what i'm gonna let that run because of exactly where we are in this game right now so it's fine um so big big tip if this applies to any role-playing game your character dies they're like sorry pal and they're like you know i'll look it at the door you take your cell phone you call a pizza now you have to be there <laughs> everyone thanks you for the pizza the storyteller lets you get away with a bunch of crazy stuff you're back in the action yep yep um but yeah so so that 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 scenario i was describing is called the corbett house uh it's a very famous one but i definitely recommend death malkavian strategy order a pizza because everyone appreciates that I take all my life lessons from Danny DeVito. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a pretty good person to take life lessons from. This so, is why he carries... Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> I know where you were going with that. Um, <laughs> anyway. So yeah, I honest, I legitimately, when, I'm, when I start a Car Call of Cthulhu campaign, I just, I'm like, create a character. Wrapped up a second one. <laughs> Because you're probably going to die. I had characters who died to the most innocuous thing at one point. I was running a one game. And I was actually running the Mask of Nyarlathotep scenario. And people... I was doing a one-shot like in the middle. Because I like to... When I'm running Masks specifically. Uh, or any of the other longer form ones. I like to mix in random side adventures. Just to keep it fresh. Because some people have read it and they know it. So I like to keep things interesting. Um, and it was one of those. And I was just making up this thing about this artist and they were investigating. They, it was weird. And they, they noticed him and there were some rumors of like people going missing in the area. So and so they're like, well, maybe it's the artist. So they were looking into the artist. And he lived in this house with his mother. And the mother was really weird too. So they got they managed to talk their way into the house because they wanted to see his art. So he invites them up to his attic, which is where he paints, and he's showing them his art, and he's talking to them. And I, I describe the art to them briefly, and but you know they're engaging with him. And then one of the two of the characters were like, "Oh, I want to look at the art more." And I was like, "Okay." And they're like, "I'm really gonna like." So I, I'm like talking them through some of the different paintings and describing them, and they I get to one. And it's like it's this one's interesting. It's a little different than the rest, and you know it's you're looking at this painting of almost like a swamp, and there's some uh, snakes and. Some Blizzard creatures and beautiful birds, and the colors are gorgeous, very vibrant. Um, it, it, it's just so, it just pops out at you, and it's very realistic. And they got entranced by it. Um, and the one character, one player was like, "Well, I'm just, I'm, I want to take in everything about this painting. I want to study it, I was like, just because yeah, I want to like talk to the artist about it." I was like, "Okay, so how long do you spend staring at?" It? And he was like, "Oh, like 10, 15 minutes." And I'm like, "Cool. Uh, roll. Uh, just give me a power." check and he did and he failed it and i was like all right um you get sucked into the painting he was like wait what and i was like yeah you get pulled you literally get it's a, the painting is a portal to another plane of existence and you get pulled into it he was like oh shit how do i get back and i was like oh. so i start describing the scene he's in the swamp now and i describe everything to him and he's like all right so i like is there a portal is there another portal that i can go through and i was like you don't see anything and he's like, so, that's amazing. So what How happens? About you paint a picture of where you were. And so I, I basically like you can what you wander around for months. Uh, so you know, surviving off the land as well as you can, and you can't find anything. And he died. Like I was like, like I described it in like five minutes, but I was like, your character is dead. He's trapped there, and he's dead. And they were like, what the hell? And I was like. <laughs> It's not a it's not a hard role to pass. He just happened to phenomenally fail it, and I was like, "You're dead. <laughs> Sorry, roll so up that new character <laughs> and have him play the rest of the game in the painting world where everybody I, else is actually like playing the adventure." <laughs> I offered. I was like, "I will play it out and see how long you survive if you want." And he's like, "Nah, I want to play a new character." <laughs> he was like, I, "He like pulled out his new character sheet and he's like, introduce me when it's convenient." And I was like, "All right, I will do that." That's the thing, like, I mean, the thing about Call of Cthulhu and other games like this um, that are brutal to the PC, if the PC is brutal with it, um, like Vampire, you know, obviously there's some 
some STs that'll kill your character, but yeah. for the most part, you can kind of expect your character to probably not die if you don't, you know, completely fuck up. But with, yeah, it depends with on Call the ST, Cthulhu, but is a big part of this game. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, one thing that's cool in tabletop role-playing games is if you die, if you have a really cool death, kind of worth it. <laughs> it's absolutely yeah. worth it. So, I can I can think of a really good example from a, a V20 game we played it. <laughs> can you? Oh yeah. It was a it was a badass death. Well, kind of. It was just very hand-waved. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to get into that sometime. That's a fun story. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to actually play that character again. Anyway. You have. I have as an NPC. <laughs> Um. So, Call of Cthulhu. Back to Call of Cthulhu, not vampire. Um, the lore. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to truncate this. We 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 are running a little short on time this evening, but so Call of Cthulhu is based on the work of H.P. Lovecraft. Um, but it's also very heavily inspired by other writers that helped shape the Cthulhu mythos over the decades. Um. August Derleth, Robert Block, Clark Ashton Smith, Robert E. Howard, who is famous for Conan the Barbarian, but he was actually a friend of H.P. Lovecraft. Um, Frank Belknap Long, Fritz Lieber, Stephen King, Alan Moore, Clive Barker. Uh, they've all contributed to the mythos in their own way. Um, and that's one thing that's very impressive about the the legacy of H.P. Lovecraft that is that he really developed this concept, and then other authors, with his permission, ran with it. Especially Clark Ashton Smith. I mean, that's one of the things that Lovecraft did is created seeds of stories, um, yep. seeds of lore, and he wasn't as. And if you haven't read H.P. Lovecraft. You'd think it would be, you know, long, arduous pages of descriptions of these, you know, like tentacled creatures. Um, a lot of that was from Clark Ashton horror. Smith. <laughs> What's that? No, he was more like indescribable horror. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially like like the unnameable is is the best example of like I can't yeah. quite explain it, but it was scary and dark and I couldn't see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but like Clark Ashton Smith really took. And added a complexity to the Cthulhu mythos that included, you know, um, the whole elements of different, you know, different uh, factions of gods that equated right. to different elements and everything else. But like a lot of the, you know, uh, oh gosh, who who is who is that writer? Um, it was years years later. Um, I'm pretty sure he did. Uh, oh gosh, the it's like the Cthulhu um, Sherlock Holmes stories. Neil Gaiman. A study in Emerald. That was Neil Gaiman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was that was like very deep into like detailing some of the the insane monsters and everything else. But like Lovecraft took a seed that so many different writers ran with. I mean, yep. even even Poppy Zebright has a really cool story that that feels very very Lovecraftian that, that oh, gets yeah. really deep yeah. um, into the descriptions. But but like Lovecraft kind of was like, okay, here's a framework, and here's some some seeds and some interesting things that you could kind of take with it. And all these writers kind of took it and made it their own. Yeah, exactly. And that's which that's... is really the best thing about being a, a storyteller who was able to give that kind of gift to the world. Um, exactly. You know. here, here, here are the seeds. I want to watch what you do with it. Yeah. Um. And then there, there's a lot of uh, contemporary authors who have done fantastic work with. H.P. Lovecraft's work. Uh, for example, um, we uh, we obviously touched on how he's a problematic writer and he's a bit racist. Um, but there are a bunch of people of color who have taken his stories and advanced them and removed that from it and kept the same theme, which is fantastic. Good night, Niva Vala. Um, the, the Ballad of Black Tom. Um, who I'm actually blanking on the author's name right now, and I feel bad about that, is a fantastic short story. Um, and then there's also Lovecraft Co Country that's being adapted into a movie by... Uh, who made Get Out? Jordan Peele. Jordan Peele, thank you. Uh, so Jordan Peele. Uh, so Lovecraft Country and Ballad of Black Tom are amazing stories. Peele of Vale, by the way, did Ballad of Black Tom. Thank you. 
um, amazing stories written from the black male perspective. So uh, adding that something that is very much missing from Lovecraft's work back into it and still at keeping that terror, um, the cosmic horror and the, the, the fear of the other in there. Highly suggest picking up and reading um, Providence by Alan Moore. Yep. Um, also, there's fantastic. another. It, it's it, uh, one. It's probably one of my favorite comics of all time. I mean, anything Alan Moore does is gold. But yeah, um, it it comes. It's from the perspective uh, of a gay man. Um, yep. And it it's kind of like I like to describe it as a, a kind of a little like tour of all of Lovecraft's work. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and then today, uh, writers like Mark Morrison, who works very heavily in in the Chaosium system, he worked on Horror of the Orient Express. He was the main writer for uh, Pax Astralis, which is a um, Call of Cthulhu supplement based in Australia. So adding in a lot of the um, folklore from Australia and putting that back in there is a fantastic there's just so much rich storytelling going on in the Call of Duty world that you can draw inspiration for it from it for any game you're running D&D, Vampire uh, Chronicles of Darkness settings you can pull so much interesting stuff for it which is why I did my V5 Providence by Night game as Lovecraftian. I wanted to pull those elements of horror into it. I'd like to see it. I'd like to. I'd like to see it the other way around too, right? Oh, yeah. Like playing, making, taking a, a Call of Cthulhu game that might start off like a Call of Cthulhu game and really turn into a holy shit, it's a Zumisi. Oh yeah, it could definitely do things of that nature. Um, certain aspects of Vampire wouldn't quite fit, but you could definitely work Fomori and Zumisi and. Um, Lupines in general, Mage. Mage is a very Lovecraftian game, if you do Love it Mage. that way. <laughs> I know you do. Um, but yeah, I, I, I want to um, open up the floor. If anyone has any questions about... Yeah, Bali Cultists, absolutely, Tobias. Uh, if anyone has any questions about Call of Cthulhu, what, what are the, like, the... If, you, if you're not familiar with Call of Cthulhu, like, what do you want to know about the system? Um... We could talk about like the differences between the books, the the tabletop books, and the actual work of H.P. Lovecraft because there's some there are some key differences between them. Um, for example, they do a very good job of removing some of the troublesome aspects of Lovecraft's work from the Call of Cthulhu tabletop game. Um, you don't really pick up on those aspects of racism that are present in some of his writing. They've done a very good job of isolating what makes Lovecraft's work truly terrifying mm. um, from the horror perspective and broadening it and giving you a fantastic framework to build a horror story. Um, I can... I can't think of a better s setting or system to craft a game that truly makes you scared for your character um, and worried about their chances of survival. I kind of yeah, go back to the mortality thing. Yep. Yeah, and not only the uh, danger from without, but the danger from within, from your character losing their mind, their perspective, yeah. their control of their self, exactly. their ability to even live in the same world they used to before without being thrown into an asylum. Exactly. And that that's something we didn't touch on is like what happens when your character drops to, you know, zero sanity. Um, it's kind of like humanity in Vampire. When you drop to zero humanity, you lose control of your character. Your character becomes a white and they're no longer a vampire. They're a just uncontrollable beast, beast. Yeah. and you literally the, as a storyteller you take the player's character sheet and you say i'm sorry your character is going to be put down they're going to probably go on a rampage and kill as many people as possible and then someone is going to kill them 
Um, and you could you should you should play that out, but effectively that's what happens. Um, it's similar in Call of Cthulhu when you reach zero sanity. Your character either goes mad and goes on a rampage and then is killed, or um, kills himself, or any number of terrible things happens to them. But turn, if they turn into that the axe murderer from uh, In the Mouth of Madness. Yep. But if, <laughs> have effectively, you read <laughs> have you have you read Sutter Kane? <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> um, but effectively, that character story is done at yeah. that point. I'm going to get going soon, guys. No, I think this is a good place to stop. So, yeah, let us know. Um, reach out on Twitter at Gehenna Gaming or drop uh, drop into Facebook if that's your jam. And we're uh, Gehenna Games on Facebook. And let us know if you have any questions about Call of Cthulhu or if you're interested in playing in a Call of Cthulhu game. Because we will be running a Call of Cthulhu game on our stream in a couple months, uh, probably right around the same time we start up our cult game. I will be running a very, very unique Call of Cthulhu campaign. Let me just say it that way. Mm. Um, so if you're, if you or just if you have questions and want to know more about it, I'd, I'd love to chat with you about it. It's a very, very personal game for me. I, I'm very passionate about Call of Cthulhu. I will talk about it. I would, I, if my job was to work for Chaosium, pfft, I don't even care if I they paid me like a dollar a day, um, <laughs> um, but or hop into our Discord. Uh, you can I'm gonna drop the link in here now, but you can pop into Discord and chat with us about Call of Cthulhu to your heart's content. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about it, or um, give you ideas if you do run Call of Cthulhu games. I'm into it, and apparently Nightbot decided that needed to send twice. <laughs> um, <laughs> And if you're if you're looking to um, to know what's coming up next on our Twitch, um, October thirty first, we're going to be just as a reminder, we're going to yep. be hosting uh, Modiphius's uh, preview of the Fall of London. Um, so catch that at two thirty p.m. Um, EST yep. um, here on this channel um, on Thursday, November seventh. We're going to have uh, melee damage um, on our cast is going to be at 9 30 p.m est yep. um so ca make sure you catch that um and soon very soon um and we will announce what date that's going to be um we're going to be having the the folks from from red moon role playing as well so make Fantastic. sure you check back um we're going to have a bunch of really cool stuff November, December, there's a lots of really cool stuff happening. Uh, December especially because we are going to be running games at PAX Unplugged. We're the only company that's going to be running V5. Um, and I believe Chaosium is going to be running Call of Cthulhu right next to us. So um, buy tickets if you have not. Go to our Twitter where you can find that information. Absolutely. At Gehenna Gaming. And uh, it's just just to, for the few of you who are very, very into it, I will be back playing Moons of Madness very soon. Um, probably next Tuesday, since we'll be doing that interview on Thursday. So stay tuned. I'll be back. I promise. It's a great game. Um, before we go, I just want to uh, give you our uh, official Gehenna Gaming shout-out for this stream. I know we did our midstream one, but I do want to give a, a quick shout-out to McStaver Studios, um, who is our running our Gehenna Gaming affiliated stream on Sundays. They're V5 Chronicle DC by night, so make sure you turn into that every Sunday. And uh, also tune in tomorrow night. They'll be running their board game stream, playing a very, very entertaining, uh, what is it, Kingdom Death Monster, I believe, uh, yeah. where you can watch uh, Mixed Ever Studios get mauled in very entertaining ways by lions and antelopes and oh my. Uh, other creatures. Oh, my. Yes. Um, but yeah, Follow them on social media, too, because they're fantastic people. Yes. Very nice. Definitely. Um, so... Thank you very much to Mixed Ever Studios for being a fantastic affiliate for Gehenna Gaming. And if you're interested in being an affiliate, let us know. We're launching a bit of a program there. Um, so we can talk about it more on our Discord if you are interested. But that is it for us tonight.
Thank you very much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed hearing all about the news from PDXCon, and hopefully we will have new new news uh, about all of the World of Darkness media coming out soon that we will discuss with you. But until then, rest well. Have a good night, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.